Hello, everyone. I'm here with Nadia Ekbal, who is working on the Writer Experiences Substack, but has broadly spent time in the open source space um, researching and is also deeply interested in how creators sort of perform online. She's also the new author of Working in Public, Amazing Cover, The Making and Maintenance of Open Source Software. Thanks for joining us, Nadia. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so let's just start with the really sort of basic part here. This is a conversation about tech news. We're focusing on creators a little bit later, but I want to sort of start with your book. And before we get into the details of the book, I want you to sort of comment on the phenomenon of sort of things like Stripe Press, which is a really interesting project for me. That's something where you have people within the tech industry telling tech stories and certain topics and not really sort of going through the intermediaries. So could you just sort of talk about that phenomenon if you have sort of any general thoughts there? Yeah, sure. I can talk about it from my experience as an author, which is part of why I'm so excited about things like Straight Press, going through the experience myself. Um, if you're someone who's writing about an interesting topic and uh, you want to write a book, um, the, there are a couple of different buckets of like paths available to you. You could go for like a more traditional publisher, um, sort of like the big name uh, box bookstore kind of uh, publishers that you might see in like the airport kind of vibe. Um, or in, in my case, I was interested in working with academic press uh, because the work I'm doing is sort of more research based. But uh, when I kind of went out to go and, and, and see um, like who I was going to work with and, and exploring, just like talking to publishers about like turning my work into a book, um, I was just like really surprised to see, I guess, that a lot of publishers um, just like don't really understand what is happening in tech and don't understand some of the stories that are um, developing in our corner of, of the world. A lot of it is still really influenced by what's happening in kind of more um, institutional version of academia. Um, and so if you have ideas that you think are really interesting, um, but the people that will you know, choose to publish your book or not are like not necessarily in tune with those ideas or they don't necessarily understand what they're about, um, which I, I kind of felt in my case, writing about open source, um, it's, it, you end up in the situation where you're sort of like, well, I, I don't really know who to go to. I don't really know who will take a chance in those kinds of ideas. Um, and so I think things like Stripe Press or other sorts of book publishers that are, are cropping up um, that can really like speak from a perspective of like deeply understanding tech and have that sort of DNA are, are really useful to have. Um, it's that question of like, you know, how do, how do people with interesting ideas in Silicon Valley or people that are working in tech more broadly, um, how do they find a larger platform? And right now, a lot of people who um, are able to give credence to your ideas aren't necessarily the people that like understand tech. So um, yeah, Straight Press is still obviously um, a young and new project, but um, I think we should be having hopefully more publishers like that who are um, capable of just like understanding what's interesting in tech and what is being overlooked and which stories need to be told. Yeah, so just two quick follow-ups on that because it's very interesting. What's a story in tech that the sort of more traditional publishers you encountered think is happening but really isn't happening or at least the conversation is sort of moving past? And then what's something, and I'm sure this relates to your book, that is happening that they're not aware of, right? So firstly, what are they sort of the conventional wisdom think is happening and what's something the conventional wisdom is ignoring? Gosh, so many things. Um, I, I often think about sort of like the archetypes of people that I come across working in tech and that me and my friends will talk about in tech. And, um, and I feel like a lot of those are really missing from mainstream media. So, I mean, if you look at, you know, stories that people tell about working in tech, it's usually one of two things. It's uh, most typically, it's about a founder who started some really big company and um, sold it. It's kind of like the, the social network kind of story. Um, or you might see a slightly different flavor of it of like, you know, an early employee at a big company who was there from the, the early days and gives you that insider perspective. But they're all really centered around sort of like big tech or like startups that became really big companies. Um, but like the stories I think are really interesting in, in tech are like not necessarily just like founders. There, there are many more ways to um, have an impact in this world. Um, and so I often feel like stories about um, people, I mean, to, uh, being a little biased here, but like people like myself, and I, I know so many others who are maybe um, exploring uh, research or ideas or um, not necessarily in this very clean binary of like startup venture capital ecosystem, but kind of um, operating a little bit more in the periphery. Uh, like I, when I think about the things that are really interesting about tech, it's not just that 
people can come here to start companies. That feels like a very like Silicon Valley B1 maybe um, to mm -hmm. talk about, but, uh, but there are people here that are just coming to like, coming to tech because they're attracted to like the idea of tech and what it means, which is still this really amorphous concept, but um, it, it's, it's a place to like come with whatever your crazy ideas are and then find other people to talk to about those. Um, and so I feel like there are a lot of stories, uh, just a lot of like richness and complexity around tech culture. Um, like I, I think like things like the, um, like the impact of like Burning Man on tech culture is like often mocked in mainstream media, but not really understood. Um, and things like that are, um, yeah, just like almost like caricaturized. And I think part of it is that the only people that really will go out and like find a platform for that in more mainstream media are people that are maybe not really deeply understanding it themselves in tech. Yeah. So we're sort of talking about the mainstream media and these sort of conversations, how much and it's so hard to tell like what's Twitter, what's real life, like how much of the sort of like quote unquote East Coast, West Coast beef between media and tech is sort of a very online Twitter thing where people are sort of, I think, engaging in their sort of worst impulses. How much is that sort of an online thing? How much is that a real thing as you sort of think about it? Yeah, it's really funny. I uh, Before I joined Substack and got exposed to a much wider swath of writers and media and just like a much broader landscape, um, it felt like it was a really, really big thing, like like clearly tech and media are at war with each other on, on Twitter. And then um, now after kind of just like seeing the broader writer landscape, um, I feel like tech is, I, I've come to just really appreciate what a tiny slice tech is in like the greater like media world and just like conversation, what people are talking about. Um, like I, I, some of the like drama that has sort of boiled up in the past year, I, I would have friends kind of asking about like, how do media people view this person or that person? I'm like, I actually don't really know that they know these people like this. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so it's just sort of a, a strange experience that within tech, I think we have this very, very clear understanding of like who we are and what we stand for. And it's like a very developed identity, but then um, you go outside of tech and most people just like have no idea what's happening in here. And it just continues to sort of boggle my mind. Like, I feel like the equivalent of that of maybe like Hollywood and the entertainment industry, like there's been a lot of cultural ar artifacts that have been created around that. Um, and people like at least have some understanding of like what is like celebrity culture and what is entertainment culture. Um, but I feel like with tech, it's still this sort of black box. People use the stuff that we create, but they don't really understand like what the what is going on behind the scenes. Um, and yeah, it's like there's so much work to do, I think, in really like exposing that and like creating a narrative that I think people here can be proud of. Yeah. So the part of the, your book that really relates to our conversation today is just sort of the, your idea that what's, what, what we're seeing in the history of open source communities is actually applying to the broader internet as well. So can you just sort of just like articulate for less sort of in the know listeners, like what sort of a, what open source is, what the community is and why this sort of transition from sort of the 1990s to sort of today is also being mirrored in other spaces where you have creators, whether they're writers at Substack or podcasters are sort of having to sort of navigate these dynamics as well. Sure. So um, open source software refers to this idea that um, you can write and publish code that anyone can freely use online. So it's uh, it's sort of like the public version of code in contrast to code that is written in companies that nobody can see or use. Um, and it's basically used for like every company, whether they're making private closed source software or not is using open source software in their own code. So like Facebook uses open source code in their own apps. Um, YouTube uses open source code in their own apps. Uh, yeah, Everybody is using open source. So it's sort of like this um, digital infrastructure that is like forming this layer across all sorts of software that we might use. Um, and so the way that we typically think about open source and, and how it's built is that uh, it's built by volunteers. Um, when you publish your code online, anybody can submit a contribution to it. And, um, and and so in that way, you can imagine like, you know, strangers and hundreds of developers around the world that are all like collaborating on the same piece of code that is then made publicly available to everyone. Um, and early on in kind of like the early days of open source, uh, let's say the late 1990s and the early 2000s, uh, this was around the same time as kind of like the birth of the consumer internet. Uh, open source became this poster child for the idea of like how the internet might foster collaboration around the world in all sorts of ways, not just in open source, um, because it, it formed this really romantic image of um, uh, like people that don't necessarily know each other around the world that are like 
finding this piece of code and like landing upon it and like um, and working together despite not really knowing each other. It's the this, the same sort of story that we have around Wikipedia and um, and how how that just like is a really I guess like rosy image of like how people could work together. Um, and I, I think that held up for you know maybe like 10, 15 years. Um, but at some point, the internet kind of just it grew to a certain scale that doesn't really support that anymore. Um, if you can imagine like a, a room full of, uh, of of like your friends that are, um, you start with maybe like two people and you add like 10 people and you add like a hundred people. And then if you had like a million people in a room, it's just like, it's not the same sort of dynamic as uh, when you had like a hundred people. And so um, open source kind of like mirrored that transition over the years where it used to be a little bit more of that kind of um, loose hobbyist kind of club feeling where the people that were using open source were also the people contributing to it. And you had a little bit more of this like membership feel to the experience. But, um, but at this scale now, when you have like millions of people that are using your open source project, um, it's not really possible for everyone to just like be in the same room together and, and have a conversation about it. And so you end up seeing this, um, this transition where instead of people kind of like looking at each other in the proverbial room, they start orienting towards looking at a stage um, where most open source projects, even if they have like hundreds or thousands of contributors, really most of the work is being done by a very small handful of maintainers. There's, you know, maybe like one or two people that are responsible for most of the work on the project. Um, and so it's a very different sort of way of thinking about um, collaborating it's it's not so much I guess even like collaborators, but really like um, a, a small set of maintainers that are doing this work for a much larger audience. So you can picture a little bit more of like a stadium style community um, rather than the hobbyist meetup kind of club. And I think this uh, was really mirrored in uh, the shift that we're also seeing on the social web over the past uh, couple of years in particular, where originally you know people were not really talking to each other at all. You had these um, online forums that were very like disparate and, and disconnected. And then we had this rise of social platforms like Facebook or YouTube um, that, uh, that, that brought all those communities together and made it really possible to like discover other communities that were different from your own. Um, but it also kind of like smashed everyone together into the same room. Um, yeah. And suddenly you're like, oh, I don't actually know that I want to be <laughs> talking to this person or seeing this person. Um, and, uh, and and yeah, so at some point it just sort of becomes this like chaos on Twitter, uh, which anyone using Twitter might uh, have experienced or felt or seen. Um, and I think we're now seeing this like new wave emerging in the past couple of years where people are actually looking to uh, reconnect and find that feeling of like, maybe I don't actually want to be talking to like a million people in a room. I want to be talking to like the hundred people that I really know or the 10 people that I really trust, um, which is part of why I think we've been seeing this rise of um, things like group chats or podcasts or newsletters, which offer a little bit more of that quiet space, um, but are also sort of structurally shaped in a similar way to open source projects where you have maybe like one person at the helm who can like broadcast out in a more intimate kind of um, space the way like if you're writing a newsletter, you are publishing to a wide audience, but then your interactions are mostly sort of like one on one with your subscribers. Um, it's not really it's not a community in the same way that we might imagine like an internet forum. Yeah, I think that's so interesting, especially around your delineation between the environment people are seeking with a newsletter or something like the public square, these sort of see of Twitter, because it's not that these are necessarily competing against one another, because in some contexts, I want to go to like a big music festival, or I want to go to Burning Man. But in other contexts, I want to go to an intimate dinner where I sort of know everyone. So it's not as if these things are directly in competition, or maybe you disagree, but it seems to me that my takeaway from your point is that the sort of take about insert like substack replacing X or Y format or Y format opinion of Substack wouldn't necessarily be true given the sort of articulation of people's desires you're you're giving. Definitely, yeah. I don't think Substack is out to kill Twitter or something like that. You know, I think we need different types of environments for different types of things. Like you said, like sometimes I want to go to music festivals, sometimes I want to just like hang out with my friends at home, um, and so I really see it as more like a enriching or deepening of what a, the social web could be. It feels sort of like weird now to think back they're like oh we only had this one type of thing like you know facebook or something where it's like entirely public uh and so like yeah just having different options um, gives us ways to sort of like move around in our digital world um based on like who we're trying to reach and what we're trying to do 
Yeah, how do you think about, and I don't really know what the equivalent would be in sort of the open source software space, but how do you think about this when we think of the idea of sort of echo chambers? So like rather than sort of being in the big group of everyone, everyone sort of silos off into their own sort of, and this would be a great word for Substack, obviously, where everyone, <laughs> where the whole country is divided into the sort of newsletter segments. But how do y'all sort of think about that dynamic? Because it's it's you're able to sort of target, but you're also not necessarily having to serve a sort of wider group of people. Yeah, I mean, I really think this idea of some broad internationally recognized version of truth that applies to everyone is something that we're going to look back on and say, oh, that just like didn't really make any sense. Um, it feels like something that is very like 90s and maybe like early 2000s to me of um, like there's there's some one true way. And I think we'll see that sort of play out as well in our social spaces where, um, yeah, I mean, like you can't really have like one newspaper that is just like the truth or like pure objective answer to everything. Like I think um, one of the effects of bringing everyone together on the internet a little bit more is realizing, oh, there are a lot of different versions of truth. And so um, as a reader or as a consumer, I'm actually just like looking for the things that are um, most relevant to my interests and my perspective. And um, it creates a new set of issues and questions of like, how do we also prevent everyone from like permanently living in their own silos and then we're like no one can really coordinate or work together because we're all operating on completely different sets of truths but i think like we kind of have to start from this point of um it's not really possible to serve one answer that will make everyone happy in the world um and i think like even attempts to say uh, to show like i mean showing people a, a viewpoint that is like extremely polar opposite from their own is like really only going to like enforce tribalism and enforce their own identity rather than helping them like see the other side like i think there's a little bit of this like rosiness around the idea that oh if only you're exposed to someone completely different with completely different views from your own like you'll like change your perspective but i think there's probably a lot more nuance that needs to happen there like there aren't just like two sides to any issue i feel like that's a very um like flattening way to look at the world there's probably like 200 different ways to look at the same issue um and like how do you help readers find the ones that resonate with them. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think we're just sort of in this era now where we're kind of flipping the script to say like, I'm not as the provider of uh, media or information, like it's not my job to serve you with like the one answer, but to instead find communities that are, um, who are really gonna like resonate with what I'm saying. And um, and so I think like one of the things that I'm really excited about at Substack is like flipping the script and having it be about like readers taking control and taking back um, they're, yeah, take, taking back control over their own media diets and deciding like, here's the stuff that I want to see and I can actually choose to subscribe to the things that um, I want to read more of. Totally. So on the Substack topic, could you sort of just explain your role, what it is that you sort of do, how you sort of um, approach things? Yeah, so um, I focus on our writer experience at Substack. Um, it's a mix of, well, it's, it's broadly understanding like what our, what does a writer journey look like? Um, in, whether you're someone who's just starting a newsletter for the first time and growing your first list of subscribers, um, all the way to people that are going independent and launching paid subscriptions. Um, there's sort of like a cycle that happens there. And so uh, what do writers actually need in this sort of movement towards independence and um, finding their own voice? And how do we translate that both um, externally in terms of the, um, the work that we put out and the messaging that we put out, and then also um, deeply understanding that experience and bringing it back into uh, represent it internally as we just sort of think about the things that we work on. Um, the two sort of like pillars that uh, we focus on at, at Writer Experience are um, the community side. So helping writers uh, get to know each other and uh, find solidarity with each other um, as well as get to know us better. Um, and then the content and editorial side of uh, what are the things that we really want to be highlighting um, as subsect to writers and um, what are the things we think will sort of like resonate with writers and help them um, understand like what is happening beyond Substack, but just sort of like this greater movement around um, writers moving towards their own independence. That's really interesting, especially on the sort of relationships between writers. So how do you, we were basically sort of talking about a sort of community building. How do you sort of conceive of sort of the stuff? Because once again, there's obviously a world where someone else has another sort of like newsletter company. Like what is unique about the Substack community that would obviously serve to lock people in and sort of build and help discovery and those sort of things? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. I feel like 
um, although there are other tools and services that exist for newsletters, I, f I, I do feel like we're one of the few that are genuinely really focused on helping writers not only write better, but also see their writing as a, a source of strength and power and something that is not um, uh, just like not something they have to do on their periphery, like making it really front and center to their identity. Um, there are a lot of things we do to support writers and there's so much more that we, we could and should be doing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think of it in a couple different buckets. Like one aspect is just sort of like the writing process of um, writing is a very <laughs> lonely and isolating kind of thing. Um, even if you find other people to uh, talk to about writing, like in the end, it's kind of like you alone at your screen that you're just like, you know, having to make it happen somehow, right? Like translating what's in your mind into words. Um, and so it's a, a very like hard thing to do regularly, even whether you're doing it for paid uh, subscriptions or not, but just, um, yeah, that that's a very new experience for a lot of people. And, uh, and so like helping writers understand like, what does that process feel like? And you don't have to be alone and um, finding other writers to sort of like bond with over that shared experience, I think is important. Um, there's an aspect around just sort of like education and uh, resources around how do I be successful as a writer? Um, newsletters are a very new creative medium. Like they've obviously been around as a marketing channel for a really long time. Um, but I think the way in which people are writing newsletters in the past couple years is significantly different from the way it was in the past. Um, and so a lot of a lot of questions I get from writers are related to this question of like, how do I think about my newsletter versus writing a blog versus tweeting? Um, like what is what is different about this and how, how do I be successful uh, as a newsletter writer? Um, and so there's a lot of just sort of like education around that. And then um, as, as well as like, if I want to have a paid newsletter, like what is even that uh, is like a whole brand new kind of topic for a lot of people. So um, yeah, a lot of a lot of work around that. And then um, and then I think just this, yeah, this broader thing around uh, what does it mean to be an independent writer and um, and not go through, say, like a newsroom or an organization to uh, to be able to say what you want to say. And we offer a number of services. Um, that we're continuing to explore and refine uh, to support writers, but a couple of them that we've um, mentioned in uh, or th that we've written about. Um, one is the Defender Program, which where we offer um, legal support or writers can apply for for legal support if they're facing any sort of legal threats or issues. Um, we will stand behind you and um, and pay your fees. Um, and another one is a mentorship program that we recently launched to help connect. Um, emerging writers who are trying to find their way with established writers on Substack to um, just sort of like benefit from that kind of uh, closer mentorship and relationship. Um, we've also done like a fellowship to um, offer emerging writers um, more support stipend grant to um, to grow their businesses on Substack. So uh, yeah, I think that we, one of the things that's just like great about, uh, about working Substack is like everyone here is here because we have some personal relationship to writing and to the experience of being a writer. Um, and we all just like really deeply care about making that happen in the world. I mean, that's how I ended up at Substack because I had the experience of being a writer and I was like, I want to do that for more people. Um, and I think that that feeling is shared uh, throughout the rest of the company. Yeah, so as I'm thinking of Substack, I think of sort of two different categories of writers and I'm sure there's a third category or a fourth you should correct me on, but I think of a really smart person who is coming into this format for the first time, sort of at one end of the other end, you have the sort of Andrew Sullivan's of the world who've been doing this for a long time, or sort of within sort of existing media organizations or had massive audiences with their own and are sort of porting that audience into Substack. So what are the sort of, if you're thinking about the writer experience, quote unquote, what are the differences in needs from both, uh, from both ends of those of the spectrum? People that are kind of just starting out and people that are. Yeah, you know, yeah, but versus who are porting in their massive audiences okay. um, and then are able to sort of get, 50, you know, tens of thousands of subscriptions within a three month period, which is not obviously the normal experience yeah. for anyone who's starting out. Yeah, I think on the um, earlier end of things for people that are just starting out, um, some of it is just sort of showing how they should be thinking about uh, growing their lists and becoming successful on Substack. Um, whether they start with like just a free list, there's the question of like, how do I get my first hundred signups? Um, how do I continue to establish a, a, a consistent writing schedule and rhythm? Um, what do my subscribers actually want to hear from me? And so there is a lot of, uh, I think it's heavier on that education side to 
kind of um, show the path of like, here's where, here's where you are, here's where you could be in, you know, six months. Um, here's how you know when, if you're ready to go paid um, and how to think about a paid launch. Um, so there's just a lot of, I think, more tactical stuff to think about um, for writers that are kind of on maybe like the Andrew Sullivan end of things. Um, it's a lot more around things like services, support, um, the questions that they're dealing with are much more around scale. So mm -hmm. um, just having thousands of subscribers is uh, a lot of sort of like management for um, uh, one, one of our sort of like top tier paid writers. And um, and so and so a lot of what we're doing there is trying to think about like what are the services that we can offer? How can we support your continued growth? Um, and like always thinking about like how do we actually turn these into programs and things that we can continue to offer to more writers? Like I think a lot of what we've kind of prototyped on the uh, with our top tier writers ends up becoming things that we learn how to scale and offer to a broader swath of writers. Um, so that's something that we're always trying to kind of learn from. Yeah, I'm sure something you're considering, especially at the bigger end subscription wise, is how do you build communities around? How do you create tools so that people could build communities of their subscribers? This sort of goes into sort of the broader sort of thing people are thinking about. So um, to the actual topic of this event in our last sort of four minutes or so, as you're, you know, you're someone who's a writer separate from all your work at Substack, as we're sort of thinking about the existence of tools like Substack, then they'll be able to monetize themselves and develop their sort of skill set. What are sort of gaps that you are personally interested in and that maybe Substack is sort of thinking about that sort of can't just be served right now, but you're sort of seeing in the market? Hmm. Um, I mean, yeah, just questions that I'm sort of broadly thinking about that are still kind of unanswered by the subscription question. Um, one of them is like, what is like, what does it look like for writers to build media empires around themselves? Um, I think subscriptions are our bread and butter because that's like, we believe in creating that kind of recurring revenue relationship with your subscribers and all the benefits that it offers around just a closer relationship and it, um, having a really positive effect on the way that you write. But like writers also write books um, or they might also do like a podcast and um, we offer some of that sort of functionality at, at Substack. Um, you can have a podcast and a newsletter um, and and do that all sort of like under one brand. Um, but like, I think I'm always thinking about what are the other things that like, if we're really thinking about like these, the, the writers we're talking about, they're really growing these like media brands around themselves. Um, how do we support that? Or how does anyone really support that? Um, it's sort of like a full suite of offerings. Um, another thing that I just sort of think about long term, and this isn't really as relevant to Substack, but it's something we'll surely have to address at some point. Um, is a question of just like, what does what does equity look like for creators? Um, like, how do you how do you, like I, you know if you're a founder and you start a company, um, you're not necessarily just making money from your salary, you're making money from the equity that you're getting in, um, in building some, in, in an institution, right? Um, and I don't know what the equivalent of that is for creators yet. Like what comes next after subscriptions and um, what does it mean to have kind of like an ownership or a stake in your work that you're creating um, that pays in the way that equity pays? Um, and yeah, so I think that's like, you know, it's still really early days for subscriptions and um, it's really only in the past couple of years that I feel people are starting to take it seriously. I mean, the conversations I have about Substack now versus a year ago are completely different um, in a good way. So I think like we still have a long ways to go on that, but I kind of think about like what happens after subscriptions, I think is that, that next question of like, um, both around like, what does it look like to create more of like an empire around yourself, not just having like a specific uh, revenue stream. And then like, what does it look like to create sort of like equity and ownership for people that are um, doing creative work? Yeah, that's really interesting just because the last sort of bit here, what comes to mind is a lot of, and once again, the scale is sort of different here, but this is sort of why a lot of, you know, tech platforms give like influencers, like equity in the sort of platform they're building up. Um, you're, you're seeing sort of like TikTok competitors do this. So I, I, people are sort of trying to figure out how that sort of works. Um, but I think, I think that's a really great place to end on. Um, Nadia, thank you so much. Um, definitely check out the book. It's really super interesting and it makes, as I showed you, an excellent display cover, even if you're not gonna um, read it long-term.